Welcome to this Spanish Armada Ireland webcast. In May 1985, the wrecks of three Spanish Armada ships were discovered at Strija Beach in Sligo, lying in shallow water. I suppose, Colin, just to set the scene, how was it that three wrecks or three ships from the Spanish Armada were wrecked at Strija Beach in the northwest of Ireland in 1588? Well, they weren't meant to be there. They were meant to be offloading a, an invasion army on the south coast of England, but all sorts of things went wrong for them. Uh, the weather was not in their favour. The English fleet were obviously trying to stop them from carrying out this invasion. But most of all, the plan that they were working under, the plan that had been framed by their king, Philip II of Spain, was, to put it bluntly, a lousy one and was almost bound to fail. And unfortunately for the poor officers in charge of the Armada, they knew this perfectly well, but they couldn't disobey their king. So what happened, they were driven into the North Sea and their commander, the Duke of Medina Sidonia, decided that the only thing he could do, and he was probably entirely right, was to try and get as many of his ships back to Spain uh, in, as, in an, uh, as intact a way as possible. And to do that, they had to go right round the north of the British Isles, up towards Shetland, round and into the Atlantic. And when they got a fair way into the Atlantic, to head uh, for the ports of northern Spain. Now, again, they were very unlucky with the weather because the, the winds that year, the autumn gales, the winds of God, as their Protestant adversaries would have it, blew early and with unusual violence, and they were driven to the rocky coasts of Western Ireland. And many of them were wrecked, including the three on Strija, who got caught uh, in this uh, unfortunate wind um, and uh, were driven onto the beach uh, where they were wrecked. So that wind, which became known, I suppose, in times as the Great Gale Nessa, it was a massive storm and the ships stood no chance. We actually know pretty much what happened on the beach that day. There were mm -hmm. contemporaneous accounts. Maybe just describe some of those to us, what, what happened once the wrecks happened and the sailors ended up on the beach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're really fortunate, Michal, to have the contemporary account of Francis Francisco de Cuellar, who was on the Lavia. And he was actually a prisoner on the Lavia because he had disobeyed orders and he was awaiting trial at the time of the wrecks on Strida. But he did manage to make it onto the beach and he gives a really graphic account of his complete experience in Ireland from that moment right through um, his journeys through the Irish countryside into the land of O'Rourke and Midlancy and his, then his passage from Ireland across to Scotland. But in terms of the scene on the beach, um, we're introduced to individual personalities, um, noblemen who are on the ships, um, men like Martin de Aranda and Don Diego Enriquez, um, who, who was initially saved, but um, the boat that he was on capsized. But we have descriptions of the hundreds of Spaniards um, in a terrible state, really, um, and then, um, the local population are a number of them descending upon the beach and um, trying to take advantage of the wreck insofar as they could. And then he has descriptions of the hanging of some of the noblemen um, and how, he's, how he spent the night in Stod Abbey, which is just up at the head of the beach, and then um, got some assistance um, from the O'Rourke's and subsequently the McClancy's. Um, but he, he certainly gives a very graphic description, very detailed description of, of the ships coming ashore and having, getting grounded and having the people on board having no option but to take, take their chances in, in, in the stormy seas. And uh, Colin, uh, the, the letter is incredible, uh, de Cuellar's letter. There were other accounts, of course, taken at the time. It was the time where written accounts was a really central part of the Armada, wasn't it? It was the only way basically they could communicate with each other. So we, we get a pretty realistic picture, do we, of what was happening at the time. But do, have we an accurate picture, do you think, of what happened at Street? One of the most remarkable things about, or the many remarkable things uh, about de Quella's letter, was how he described the 
country folk and the, the, how life went on in the west of Ireland in 1588. And this is a source we, we haven't got from anywhere else. Nobody wrote about how the people lived, but <coughs> Quella thought it was, he called them savages, which was a bit, a bit rude really, but um, he, he was fascinated by uh, uh, the, the, the local people, particularly the, 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 the good looking young women uh, mm -hmm. who he seemed to have quite an eye for. Uh, so we learn a lot about not just the Armada, but what life was like at the time in that part of the world. But other sources, um, for example, the, the, the uh, English Lord Deputy of Ireland at the time, Sir William Fitzwilliam, uh, a few weeks after the actual um, event had happened, rode along the beach uh, and was amazed at the size of the ships, not that they were intact, uh, they'd all been smashed up and, and driven ashore uh, along the beach. But he said that, you know, uh, uh, the wreckage he saw would make five, not three, of the biggest ships he'd ever seen. And he said the masts were twice as thick as any uh, masts he'd ever come across. So we're getting, getting it from different sources. And it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And Colin, in relation to the three Strigia ships, um, you know, quite detailed descriptions were written before they set out at all, along with all of the 120 odd ships that left Lisbon. Um, so what do we know in terms of, say, the amount of soldiers on board, in terms of the ordnance on board, the cannon numbers, etc.? Well, before the Armada sailed, they had a, what they called a muster, which was a, a great sort of parade at which everything was listed. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't completely accurate. Accountants never get it wholly right, but it, it is a, a, a remarkable document, uh, which is 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 summarising just how big and how well equipped the fleet was. Uh, so, for example, the Juliana, one of the the um, uh, wrecks uh, on Strija, um, built in Barcelona in 1570, um, just before the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, she was 860 tons, carried 32 guns, and there were 203 soldiers on board, as well as 71 um, uh, seamen. Now, um, uh, the, uh, the other one, another one, uh, the La Via, the one that uh, De Quella was on, was the vice flagship of the Armada's Levant Squadron, which came from the Mediterranean. Uh, she'd been built at Venice and uh, was 728 tons, carried 25 guns, and again had 325 soldiers and 70 uh, mariners. And finally, the Santa Maria de Vison, a, a bit smaller at 666 tons and 18 guns, um, she came from Ragusa, modern Dubrovnik in the Adriatic. <laughs> So there's a terrific uh, variety of different types of ships from different places, and that adds further interest. Uh, it's not just a Spanish armada, it's, a, it's almost a European armada. And Philip II of Spain, of course, Nessa, had gathered together as many different ships, whether they were Spanish or not, including mm -hmm. the three Strigia ships. The Strigia ones were merchant uh, ships. They were used to, you know, traveling the Mediterranean, yeah. basically carrying grain and other supplies. They weren't warships. So no. isn't that, there's this, the, the, I suppose, the situation that in winter storms, they were never going to stand a chance of returning to Spain. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, there was an awful lot again, working against that fleet from the moment that they left Lisbon. Um, they weren't properly equipped. Their navigation skills weren't all that they should be. The weather went against them. Um, and of course, they wouldn't have been particularly familiar with, they wouldn't have been at all familiar with the, with the coast of Ireland. And by the time they got to the west coast of Ireland, you had a lot of exhausted sailors, I would think, as well. I mean, they would have been at sea for a very long time. Um, they had a bruising encounter in, in the channel. And then they had, as Colin was just saying, they had to work their way they ended up working their way all the way around the north of Scotland. Um, so they were exhausted apart from anything else on a purely human level. Um, but I suppose it's, it's now very much a gain to the heritage of Ireland, a challenging one in terms of resources. But Strida is particularly special because it's the only place where you have three Armada wrecks all in one small bay. But it is an ongoing challenge, undoubtedly. We'll talk about those challenges maybe a little later on, but mm -hmm. Colin, let's fast forward so to 1985. 
And maybe just to discuss briefly prior to 1985, I mean, you had dived on several Armada ships in Ireland. You had dived on the Trinidad Valencera off uh, the Inishon Peninsula and on the Santa Maria de la Rosa in Kerry. What talk was there among archaeologists like yourselves in terms of, say, what potentially might lie at Strija? Well, one thing I would like to say at the outset uh, is that at the time this all happened, there really was no uh, legislation, particularly cultural legislation, to protect shipwrecks of this kind, either in uh, Ireland or, or in the United Kingdom. Uh, so it, it could very well have been that the people who got involved first were out and out treasure hunters who would have ransacked the sites uh, purely for the value of what they what what they were able to to to, to find. Uh, that this didn't happen was partly due to good judgment by a number of people and partly due to luck. The first two wrecks to be discovered were the Santa Maria de la Rosa uh, on the southwest tip of Ireland. Um, and just before the, that discovery, uh, the Belgian uh, underwater explorer Robert Stenui uh, had um, uh, discovered the Girona uh, in, uh, off the coast of Antrim. Um, now, either of those could have gone the wrong way. Happily, I think the best thing that happened to us with the uh, Santa Maria de la Rosa is that we didn't find any treasure. I think that would have just complicated things enormously, but we found quite a lot uh, about the Armada and more, more importantly, uh, there were things we didn't understand that posed new questions which led to more, more research. In the case of the Girona, uh, Robert Stenui recovered, uh, did recover treasure uh, I think, uh, with all respect to him, he would have sold it if he'd felt he had to, because he had to pay for his operation. But by great good fortune, uh, the keeper of the Ulster Mu of Archaeology at the Ulster Museum, Lawrence Flanagan, realized how important this collection was and raised the money to purchase the entire collection, uh, where it, uh, and it's now on display in the Ulster Museum. So these wrecks didn't go the wrong way. The third wreck I was involved with uh, was the, the Trinidad Valencera off Donegal. Uh, all the people had got off, fortunately for them and for us, because again, they took the treasure with them. So we didn't have that complication to deal with. Um, and there the heroes uh, were the city of Derry Sabacqua Club who found the wreck and who determined from the very outset that everything should be done properly and with archaeological sensitivity, and that most importantly of all, that the finds uh, should be retained as an intact, well-conserved collection. And again, our friend, sadly uh, now deceased, Lawrence Flanagan, uh, uh, stepped in, and uh, the Ulster Museum, even though the wreck was in the Republic, uh, the Ulster Museum took on the conservation uh, tasks, which as Nessa mm -hmm. says, vital and uh, expensive and difficult um, on the understanding that should uh, the accommodation become available uh, the material would be displayed not in the Republic but in Derry uh, where the club uh, ha, 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 the, the Sabak club who found it um, uh, were, were there um, and that has all happened there is now the collection is conserved uh, and it's on this public display in Derry, and I was lucky enough to be the the um, archaeologist who, who um, uh, as it were, uh, directed the whole um, archaeological enterprise underwater. And so far, uh, the Trinidad Valencera has been the, the the most productive in terms of objects and of information of all the Armada wrecks. But um, one day, it will undoubtedly be surpassed by the uh, wrecks on Strida. Nessa, would you care to come in on that? Just the absence of, as you yeah. say, a framework for Strija. People didn't really know yeah. how to approach wreck sites in the Republic. Is that right at the time? Yeah. Um, well, we did have some experience. You know, I'd be the first to say that we didn't have um, a, a framework for underwater archaeology in the way that we do now. But even when you go back to the shipwrecks that Colin has just mentioned, like the Trinidad Valencera and the Girona, um, they were in Irish waters, but it was agreed between the National Museum, the director of the time, E.T. Lucas, and the authorities in the Ulster Museum, that they were best equipped to deal with 
the wreck from, from the Trinidad Valencia and the Girona. So it wasn't, there was definitely a recognition that, that they were sites of great importance and that the objects from them must be handled properly, properly conserved. But it's just, we weren't, we certainly weren't equipped at the time of the Trinidad Valencia and the Girona. Um, and really in truth, things hadn't changed all that much by 1985 except that the same principles were definitely in force. I mean, I can remember the Keeper of Irish Antiquities at the time in the National Museum, my boss, who was Michael Ryan. I remember him saying, we not only have a responsibility to our own heritage in Ireland, but we also have a European-wide responsibility to all the countries whose heritage is represented on those wrecks. And at that time, I suppose, we would have had Spain primarily in mind. But the National Museum was definitely thinking in terms of our heritage, that it was part of our heritage, but also that we had responsibility beyond that to make sure that everything was fully surveyed, recorded, and really at that time, I suppose, we, we didn't want anything further, the, further to be raised because we had to um, keep the exploitation of the wreck, the investigation of the wreck in line with the resources that were available. And this was before, for example, those of you who are familiar with the National Museum of Ireland, it was before we had the Collins Barracks site in Dublin. It was before we had the state of the art conservation laboratory that we have now in terms of the building and facilities. Um, as Colin mentioned, um, there was really only merchant shipping legislation in force, the Merchant Shipping Act of 1894. And here in Ireland, we had the National Monuments Act 1930, amended in 1954. Um, the 1987 Act, which brought in um, the regulation of diving on shipwrecks, excavation of archeological remains in, in the water, whether it's on seabed or lake bed, that came in in 1987. Now, it was actually in the process of being drafted. It was also to do with the use of metal detectors, um, the regulation of consent or detection devices on, on to detect archeological sites to control that as well. Um, so it didn't actually happen as a result of the finding in Strida, but it was, I suppose, mm -hmm. in truth, it was quite timely in that it, it provided some regulation of what happens when divers decide to dive on historic wreck. Okay. Um, okay, and that's, that point is well made. Okay, so I want to actually get into the dives themselves. So. And um, Colin, you got involved a little bit after the initial dives took place. So maybe just fill in what happened to us when, when a group of, of British divers came to Strija at the start of May and began diving. Who were they and what did they find? They were a group uh, of divers from, from England, as you say, from the Midlands. Um, and they had been fascinated by the uh, Armada, uh, or two or three of them in particular, and most especially Steve Birch, who, who is now a, a, a professional archaeologist himself on, on land as well as underwater. Um, and, and he was, I think, the driving force. Uh, these were the fairly early days of um, side scan sonar and, 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 and the kind of electronic uh, searching methods. Uh, of a size that could be operated from a small inflatable boat. Uh, so they arrived at Strija uh, just to prospect for things um, and immediately found the three wrecks. I mean, they zoomed up and down, uh, you know, just offshore, off the beach, um, and ping, 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 they got the three contacts. And on one of them, the one that turned out to be the Juliana, uh, they found that it it had recently been exposed. Uh, there were cannons, bronze guns, uh, these large wheels from the uh, siege carriages that the ship had, uh, was carrying. So that, that was the discovery. Um, at that time, the only way they could legally, uh, in, in legal terms, take possession of the wreck, in other words, be the discoverers with, with rights, was to make some recoveries from it. Now, in those days, uh, both in Ireland and, and in the UK, uh, 
the, the concept of sovereign possession was a very important one. But in order to achieve that, you had to lift something from the wreck. Now, an archaeologist wouldn't want to do that. You'd want to check, uh, you know, that things were stable, what condition they, they were in, uh, what the conservation uh, consequences might be if anything was lifted, etc., etc. But if you did th those right things at that time, uh, you couldn't stop another person just wading in and saying, we don't care about all this nonsense about conservation, we just want the money, so we'll whip them all, all up. And that was why the, the guns were lifted at that early stage, uh, to avoid, well, to make a claim, as it were, on the wreck, but also to avoid the possibility, indeed probably the likelihood, that less well-intentioned people, greedy people, would come in and simply take over. I think that's, that's broadly okay. correct. Nessa, how would you read that then? And when did the National Museum become aware of the, of the discovery at Strija? Um, I think we became aware um, in May 1985. Um, I think we were contacted by a number of different people. Um, certainly the receiver of REC was involved because it was part of the merchant shipping regulation that anything that's raised from the seabed in Irish waters has to be declared to the local receiver of wreck, who was Frank Burke in Sligo at that time. There's a different receiver for each stretch of coast. Uh, generally speaking, they're um, higher um, revenue um, officials. So he was based in Sligo. Um, the local sergeant, I think his name was Sergeant Neary, he was involved also. And there were a number of locals, including Eamon who was very much involved. Um, Eamon Tolan, so I Eamon think, Tolan, yes. Eamon Tolan, yes. So I think um, in the direct sense, we were informed by our colleagues in the National Monument Service. And I suppose I should explain that in terms of archaeology and archaeological protection in Ireland, there's a dual responsibility. In the National Museum of Ireland, we're responsible for everything to do with the portable heritage, that's archaeological objects, whether on dry land or from the seabed. And the National Monument Service, as the name suggests, um, are responsible for monuments, wrecks, fixtures in the landscape or on the seabed. So obviously there's a very close relationship between the two organizations. So I think we heard, we heard in the immediate sense from somebody in the National Monument Service. And if, if Nessa, if the, if the receiver of wreck, Frank Burke, had, had contacted you, that, that means then that the divers had done the right thing. They had contacted the receiver of wreck to say yeah. that the cannon yeah. were there. Oh, yes, yes, that, that, that is true. They did, in fairness, fulfill those requirements and the cannon were taken into the possession of, of the receiver, as, as was the correct procedure. And it was agreed with him um, that they would be held to his order, but located at the Office of Public Works depot in Drumahare in County Leitrim, which wasn't all that very far away. Um, so at that time, the National Monuments Service was a part of the Office of Public Works under the Department of Finance, actually. Okay, so um, we, we've skipped ahead a little bit. So I want to get back to the yeah. actual, the, 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 the dive site itself and the wreck site. And Colin, so, so you've described how, how Birch and King and their team discovered the cannon, which was a really unusual um, situation at the time, was it not? Because as any of us who know Strija know, in the vast majority of cases, the sand covers the wrecks. It's not like you can see them, you know, most of the time. So it was pure good luck that they happened to be exposed at the time and they made the decision to lift the three guns. But before they did that, they called you because you were an expert having dived on the Girona, Trinidad, Valencia and others. And what did you see when you dived on the wrecks? I should emphasize that, 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 that my role was a very minimal one. I, I only did, I think, two dives on, on the wreck. I didn't actually do anything except look around. Uh, and I was most impressed by what I saw, both in terms of what the find consisted of and the uh, work that the, 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 the team were doing in terms of survey and in, in lifting the, the three guns which were lifted on that, that first occasion. So I just saw what was going on and um, that was it. And what kind of site was it though? You know, when you saw it, were you able to kind of go down, touch cannon, see timber sticking up, gun carriage yes, wheels yes. lying everywhere? Go on, describe uh, that. Absolutely. It, 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 it was like the Trinidad, Trinidad Valencera after it had been excavated uh, some way. 
um, so that the things were visible on the seabed. Uh, the guns were uh, not exactly shining, but they were they they weren't weren't corroded at all, um, and uh, they were in remarkable condition. Nessa, you came down then once the National Museum became aware, and you were the qualified diver of the team. So you yeah, dived. Yeah, yeah. Now I did. That. I did dive, but I didn't dive until September. Um, now, as luck would have it, the museum had sent me to train as a diver. Uh, they decided that they needed one of the archaeologists on the staff of the National Museum to be a trained diver and to get involved in the sports diving community so as to ensure that a proper approach would be taken to archaeological remains. In truth, um, probably more on the inland waterways was what of, was of particular concern to us at the time because of treasure hunting. Um, so I'd, in any case, um, I actually trained earlier in 1985. So I was a very newly fledged diver. And um, I went to Strida in 1985 in September which was when the divers returned to the site um, to what well, they said they wanted to secure the site for the winter to make sure that uh, anything that was exposed um, was protected. Um, so I dived with them at that time. And do you know had the site changed much between May and September? Um, I don't think so. No, I think um, what I saw sounds quite similar to what Colin saw earlier in the year in May. Um, I went out with Stephen Birch, actually, um, and a couple of the other divers. And as I recall it, um, the Juliana was only in about 10 meters of water when we dived. Um, so it was quite shallow. Um, and I can remember very clearly seeing the rudder. Um, yes. I can remember um, running my hands along the edge of it and seeing gun carriage wheels. Um, and I think I also saw a cannon at that time, um, which was probably subsequently covered up. Um, uh, so yeah, it was it was very exciting for really effectively the first wreck I'd ever dived on, you know, because I hadn't I hadn't been a diver all that very long, but I'd spent the summer between May and September working up as much experience as I could, so that I would be ready mm -hmm. to to go and do that work. You have both described, uh, you know, a, a, a huge amount of content really there in terms of, say, what was visible at the time, uh, several gun carriage wheels, several cannon anchors, uh, smaller guns, but only in the initial dive and initial recovery operation, only three guns, three, three bronze cannon were brought ashore. Mm -hmm. And later on, a smaller gun, the Falcon Pedrero, um, which was similar to one you had seen on the Trinidad Valencera column, I think was brought ashore mm -hmm. as well by the divers. But a lot of other items remained on the seafloor and remained there mm -hmm. until 2015. Some of them still remain there, uh, a subsequent dive in 2015. Nessa, can yeah. you just describe to us, because the, the person watching this might say, why wasn't everything brought ashore at that time? Okay, you've described yeah. the money situation, mm -hmm. the finance situation was tight for the state, but what other reasons were there why the state decided, look, we can't do this right now? Yeah, well, there were a number of factors, Michal. Um, the first, I suppose the most important was that we simply didn't have the resources to deal with the consequences of even one armada wreck, the contents or the remains of one armada wreck on the seabed, it would have been colossal, even purely in terms of the numbers of cannon before you ever started um, excavating through other types of material, organic material probably, and um, from the evidence of the Trinidad Valencera, for instance, there were all sorts of other types of metal, types of objects that would be recovered. And it's, it, it's, you have to, I suppose, emphasize the fact that it's not just a question of retrieving objects from the seabed. It is to recreate, in knowledge terms, um, a moment in the life of a wreck when it left the surface and because of the circumstances that befell it, ended up on the seabed. The kind of information that you acquire in terms of scientific excavation should be sufficient to be able to really recreate a most wonderful story of what was going on in that wreck at the time that it, that it, was, that it was wrecked. In order to do that, you, you need exceptional, exceptional facilities, really. So that was one aspect of it, Michal. The other aspect was the ongoing relationship with the team of divers who had, um, 
who had who had refound the wreck, wrecks. And I say refound because um, they had been there were there were accounts of them being relo being located previously, um, where you know it hadn't been pursued any further any further. But um, so uh, the whole thing was taken very seriously, not just in the National Museum, the National Monument Service, but at government level as well. And um, in September 1985, a high level interdepartmental committee was set up actually by the late Ted Nealon, who, a Sligo man, who was Minister for Arts, Culture and the Gaelic at the time. So within the Department of the Taoiseach, they brought in officials from the Department of Finance, Department of Foreign Affairs, Office of Public Works, National Museum of Ireland. Um, so every effort was made to try and um, I suppose, deal with the evolving circumstances in terms of the divers, you know, who, you know, we accept had had reported to the receiver and all that sort of thing. But in spite of our best efforts and the best efforts of the committee, I think it became clear that we were at odds on some fundamental issues. And I can I remember, it is 35 years ago, it's a long time to remember it back, but I do recall one particular day um, where the committee organised for the divers and for a firm of London solicitors who were representing them at that time to come over to Dublin and we had a long long day of discussions uh, both directly with the divers and with the lawyers but there was just that dichotomy I suppose ultimately between what I would describe as a very interested but nonetheless salvage approach and the approach of a professional archaeologist and a national service and what we felt we had to do in Ireland, um, even if it resulted in the unpopular decision really in terms of those who were dying to see more results, that we had to put the brakes on the investigation of the wreck beyond what was already raised until there were better resources in place. So, Vanessa, can I just ask you on that? I know that there was a, a legal issue which, which went to the High Court and then on to the mm -hmm. Supreme Court. Um, and that was a huge issue that I suppose, you know, was evidence of the obstacle that existed between the dive team on one side and the state mm -hmm. on the other. And it wasn't always like that. It did become, a, you know, a, a, a sort of a, di a divisive kind of a, a situation after some time. Mm -hmm. But if the resources hadn't been an issue, if money was there to go and get the cannon out of the water, did the state have the authority to say, irrespective of what the divers' wishes are, our number one priority here is retrieve the cannon because we know the likelihood is in six or 12 months' time they'll be covered again and we mm -hmm. might see them for another generation? Um, well, we would always have a focus on the risk element and the vulnerability of wreck on the seabed. And ultimately, that's what happened in 2015. But before jumping that far ahead, just to say that um, in the years between 1985 and 2015, when the more recent cannon were retrieved, um, some of the people that you'll be interviewing later in the underwater archaeology unit were involved in continuous, if not every year, every couple of years, there were efforts to survey the sites, to return to Strida, sometimes with um, the original Stony Cove group, who of course wanted to continue their work on the site, ideally to excavate and lift material. But um, there, there were several, several um, survey expeditions in the years between 85 and 2015. And for many, many years, the sites were found to have to be completely covered up. So that, that's, that's, that's how, how things rested, so to speak. Um, so it wasn't until 2015 when another one of these surveys was in progress that it was found that, again, the Juliana had a substantial part of it had become uncovered. Colin, you've had a, a couple of minutes there to listen to what the, the state mm -hmm. was saying and what Nessa says on behalf of the National Museum. As, as a member of the dive team, how did you feel or how did the divers feel about how things were progressing? Well, I, say I wasn't a member of the dive team. I, I, I was just there. I'd been invited there as an observer. Uh, I was also invited to, to give evidence at, at the, the, the court case in, in, in Dublin. And although it was difficult and tense at times, uh, the outcome was right, in my view. And it, it wasn't really very, you, you know, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Acrimonious? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, no. and, and, and what is great, it, it needed to be tested. The law needed to be sorted out. Uh, mm -hmm. And in order to sort it out, you needed a case like that. And the outcome was terrific. Uh, I may say, I, I don't know the figures and I don't want to, but uh, I believe the settlement that the divers got was a very generous one. And they had no complaints in that score. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, it, 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 it had to happen somehow. It might have happened in a very acrimonious and difficult way. You might even have lost, as, as some cases yeah. in, UK, in mm -hmm. UK waters have been lost, uh, you know, on, on the tension between the Merchant Shipping Act and, 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 mm -hmm. and cultural mm -hmm. um, concerns. So yeah. I, I think Ireland and all the, all the people involved in, in the case came out of it extremely well, and we're all the better yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that, Michal. Um, there was a need for legal clarity. Mm. And um, at, in 1985, um, we had reasonable, a reasonable legal fr framework for dryland archaeology, but we didn't have it for maritime heritage. Um, and Mr. Justice Barr, who was the judge in the High Court, um, he followed the principles in a case called Webb v. Ireland, Webb versus Ireland, which was the case surrounding the Durin the Flan chalice, the finding of the Durin the Flan yes, hoard in County yes, Tipperary in 1980. Indeed. And mm. the essential premise of his findings was that um, the country's heritage was an essential part of its national asset, assets. And that in view of that, in our particular case in Ireland, that it would be um, inconsistent, I suppose, even with the principles of the Irish Constitution, if finders this was now in relation to dryland finds back in yes, 1980. Yes. If finders mm. of archaeological objects, that they should mm. not become exclusively the owners or possessors or mm. to have exclusive mm. access or benefit from those finds, that it was some that they were assets that should benefit all the citizens in the country as a whole. Um, so Mr. Justice Barr um, took that took that principle, I suppose, and yes. to our ultimate benefit in the long term. It mm. has now carried over so that as a state, the National Museum on behalf of the state, we can now claim unowned archaeological objects from the sea on behalf of everybody, the state, in the same way as we could claim them from dry land. But Mr. Justice Barr also, there was a very interesting phrase, which I hope I'll remember more or less, but <laughs> he said, um, he said that um, he was in no doubt, but that um, the wreck at Strida had long since departed from the realms of commercial salvage law yeah, um, yeah. and had come into what he would describe as archaeological law yes. um, long, um, long before 1985, um, that, that, that the likelihood of being able to trace the, the successors and title of the original yes. owners was so remote yes. that it wasn't like the Merchant Shipping Act is really designed for um, in terms of um, ownership rights, um, mm. personal ownership rights, it's commercial law, it's not heritage law. Yes. Um, yes. But um, so yes, we went through the High Court and then to the Supreme Court. Um, well, the Supreme Court was more to do with access to the wreck and the licensing. Mm. Um, but I'd completely agree with Colin that what we've gained from it in terms of a legal framework and the policy that's in place now is of far greater importance than actually I don't know what they were paid either <laughs> what they got in terms of reward I don't I don't know I know it wasn't anything fast but it was sufficient that was they, were, they were fairly yeah it was it was probably fair and that's what the Supreme Court said that the Supreme Court weren't going to determine um, what they should get that, that that wasn't the court's job in that case um, that it wasn't salvage, that it, it was clearly not a case of, of salvage law, and that it was a matter for what was then the Commissioners of Public Works, because um, the National Monument Service was under the commissioner, Commissioners of Public Works at the time. The one casualty of all this, I suppose, was that the, the wreck was never fully recovered and retrieved at the time. Now, Nessa has spelt out all of the different reasons why maybe that didn't take place, but as a diver, and as somebody who had seen several other Armada wrecks and had seen what could be 
taken from the sea and put on <laughs> exhibition for the public. How do you feel that the Street Rex maybe remained untouched for so many years and well, that so much of that wreck still remains untouched? I have untouched? to make an important distinction. I'm actually an archaeologist and I dive in order to get to my place of work, just as other mm -hmm. archaeologists put on Wellington boots or get in Land Rovers. Uh, so as an archaeologist, I, I, I'm very happy that it hasn't gone ahead because the object isn't to find lots of wonderful things and get a really nice television program out of it. Uh, it is to uh, be thankful that some aspects of the past have been preserved in this way and responsible that if they are going to be used by us today, they must be used responsibly. And that means keep keeping them in the right condition looking after them and most importantly ensuring they don't don't decay and and, and, and fall apart so i was very happy with all that can i just add a, a small footnote to um, the, the discussion about the reward that the divers got i have to say that when i went i was called to give evidence uh, specialist evidence or, or during the court case and i felt very well treated indeed by being having all my travel expenses paid, uh, put up in a nice hotel and all the rest of it. Many years later, as, uh, <coughs> sorry, as, as, as Nessa has, has, has explained, uh, when the, course, the, the court case finally came to an end, I got an envelope with an Irish stamp on it and in it was a check for really quite a large figure. This was my professional fee which I hadn't expected at all, but it was all part of the process of tying everything up. So I did do rather well out of the wrecks. <laughs> very, very good. Okay, well, so people were, I suppose, finally happy with both, uh, with the judgments in the end of the day, Nessa, the, the mm -hmm. museum got the, got the rights to, to, to mm -hmm. ensure the protection of wreck sites around the country and the divers themselves received mm -hmm. the compensation and, and as Colin has outlined there, his, his main interest was also always the archaeological integrity of the site. The, the final mm -hmm. aspect I suppose I want to look at is if people are interested now, so now you can see the cannon, can't you, Nessa? So maybe just describe to people if they want to see the yeah. 1985 recoveries, where do they go? Oh, yeah. Um, well, they're actually on display in our uh, military history uh, exhibition, Soldiers and Chiefs, in Collins Barracks. Um, so they're not in our Museum of Archaeology in Kildare Street, where I'm normally based. Um, so there's the large siege cannon from the Trinidad Valencera at Kinigo Bay, which Colin will remember we both spent some time on as well. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are uh, two cannon from um, Strida, which are currently on display. Um, then beyond that, um, even though we're so much better off now in whatever we are, 2020, than we were 35 years ago, um, we have the nine cannon that were raised in 2015 because they were exposed and considered to be at risk. Um, they're currently under treatment in our conservation laboratory. Um, and although we have um, you know, very good conservation facilities now, we still don't have sufficient staff or sufficient space. So effectively our large objects treatment area um, is pretty much full. We're not complaining too much, but it's very well worthwhile, needless to mention. But we're at full capacity now, really, in the treatment of those nine cannon and um, a few smaller objects that came up in 2015. Um, so until our government or whoever sees fit to maybe resource us to an even better extent, um, I think, you know, we have our agenda for the next few years in terms of the treatment of those objects. But I just say as well, Michal, just in, in, in the state's favour, I suppose, that, you know, when the High Court findings um, were, 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 were made known, um, there was an argument then that had to be made for the state to appeal to the Supreme Court in, on the issue of access and on the issue, like Mr. Justice Barr, um, while he, he found um, in our favour on the major principles of how you deal with fines from the sea, heritage law rather than sal salvage mm -hmm. law, um, it, not, it wasn't quite in our favour in terms of access to the wrecks. He felt that they should be allowed to go back and that they should get a substantial reward. 
So I immediately saw that there were implications in that for other sites. So it was important that we appealed to the Supreme Court. So, you know, what I'm saying really is that between the two cases, the High Court first and then the higher courts, you know, it, it tied it up all, you know, it tied the whole thing up very well. We've had other case law in the meantime, for example, to do with the Lusitania. So like, we have a really good legal framework. And then we've had case law, which is all the time developing the way in which the law is, the law in relation to shipwreck is regarded. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's a good story, definitely. Okay. It's, a, it's a wonderfully uh, interesting mm. story and a period of, of Stregia and Sligo and Ireland and Spain's history that, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking 35 years on and it's great to be able to discuss yeah. them while the memories are still fresh. Colin, yeah. I just want to ask you before we leave, um, there, you know, it, it is estimated that there are, there are lots more cannon and lots more artifacts that could be recovered from the Stregia wreck site. So Ness has already mentioned the three cannon of 85 taken in, the nine in, in 2015, but there were possibly up to 80 cannon from the inventory that you described earlier on in the bay. Could you see the day, Colin, would you like to see the day where further excavations might take place at Stregia? And do you think it's possible and likely that will happen? Well, probably yes, one day uh, more will be raised and it's appropriate they should be raised because ultimately if we preserve everything without disturbing it, um, no one will ever see it ever. So it, it, it needs to go forward, but very, very carefully. To start with, the uh, experience that Nessa and her colleagues are having in dealing with the material that has been discovered is beginning to create, albeit she needs more money and resources, is beginning to create the facilities and expertise needed to deal with this sort of thing. And at this point in time, I, I'm sure she will agree, uh, that the only justification for more coming that way to be preserved is because more is exposed and threatened. Uh, so the monitoring will continue and no doubt, you know, steps will be taken to deal with mm -hmm. events as they occur. Um, if there the were unlimited resources, you never know, maybe one day that will happen. Um, uh, careful, targeted um, excavation with a real purpose in mind uh, might be considered at some future date. I don't think the time is now. There's enough on everybody's plate to deal mm. with, to make things work. And this brings together not just the professional archeologists, the museum uh, uh, expertise, but also the local communities. And uh, I should also stress uh, that this isn't just a find, find of national importance as far as Ireland is concerned. It is of international mm. significance. It's our common heritage. So- Yes, exactly. You know, it, 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 it should go forward, but it should go forward carefully and responsibly. Nessa, in relation to the local community and the supports that, that all aspects of the dives uh, received, can you just outline what involvement there was by the locals? Mm -hmm. From the very outset, Michal, the local community have been so engaged and so supportive. Um, they have, you know, we can't be in Sligo all the time, either ourselves or the National Monuments Service, either the museum or the National Monuments Service. But I can remember from the very outset, the local sergeant in Grange um, saying to us, you need have no fear. You know, the local community, those who live overlooking the beach and those um, who are out there very frequently, they have the best interests of their local heritage at heart. And that was very much the experience that we had. Um, in 1986, I returned um, with a number of colleagues from the Geological Survey and we had a loan of a survey boat from DSB. At that time as well, we were really welcomed. Um, um, I remember particularly the Waters family um, at Strida. And ever since really, up to, up to 2015, the most recent investigation and to the present day, very regularly I have reports from the grant Grange Armada Development Association, new discoveries, chance discoveries at Strida. And they're very vigilant. And if there's anything amiss or any new finds, um, we always hear about them. And we would obviously be very keen to see a local museum of, 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 of a high standard uh, funded by whether it's the local authority or some, some arm of the state. Um, that would really be the ideal.
you know, it would be a fantastic theme for a museum in the Grange area. And the National Museum of Ireland uh, would be very supportive of that if it were properly resourced. Um, but, you know, in, in a nutshell, the local community are of really core importance to the ongoing um, investigation, recording, preservation, um, protection, essentially, particularly the protection of the sites. And can I just ask, as a corollary to that, would you be of the opinion that were a suitable museum to be established, that the canon that are now currently in Dublin and some of them under conservation would return to Sligo to this museum? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think there would certain, there would, that would certainly be um, a strong possibility. Perhaps not all of them, um, because a couple of the canon are an integral part now of our permanent exhibition in Collins Barracks, but that's just a small number. Um, I think we would all look very positively um, on um, a very a representative display of objects from the, the rec, from the wrecks to go on display, but it would have to be a museum of the right standard. Um, you know, you can't just stick it into, say, you know, a small building that's been used for some other purpose. Um, it would have to be properly funded and in an ongoing way. And I should mention in that context as well, Michal, that, you know, sometimes it, it might, be, might be considered that there's a program of conservation on objects like the cannon, and then that's it, it's done. But that's not quite the case. Um, there has to be an ongoing program of conservation maintenance, really. Um, objects have to be checked on an ongoing basis. It's not just a case of conserve them in 2020 and you're done, that's it. Um, they have to be cared for, displayed in the right temperature, levels of humidity. Um, there needs, needs to be records kept of environmental controls. Um, so you know, the topic, the sites, the evidence that we have so far, it's all deserving of a, of a properly funded museum. Um, I mean, there are county museums in many different parts of the country um, that the National Museum lends to, um, but we're in, inclined now to encourage uh, thematic museums rather than museums that cover everything from the year dot up to the present day because probably, you know, maybe that's better done in the National Museum. Um, but if there's an outstanding theme that connects to a particular locality, like there is for Strida, then, you know, in terms of heritage, you know, predominantly heritage from our point of view, but also local tourism, if you had a museum of the right standard, but would have to be funded on an ongoing basis, not just a great burst of enthusiasm and excitement around the opening of a museum. There has to be some organization, local authority or state organization behind it that would fund um, the unexciting overheads year in, year out, the employment of a curator, employment of other staff, and you're paying the overheads, all that sort of thing. Um, and a local group can't do that on their own. You know, they need the support. That's very true. Okay, and Colin, how would you mm -hmm. feel about that? Should the should this, the Armada guns from Strigia return to Grange to a Spanish Armada centre of national and maybe international attention and importance? Well, uh, I, I take everything that um, Nessa has said. Um, it would be nice to have a centre. You could do an awful lot that was not object related. You could explain the story, the locality, uh, in images, models, uh, audiovisual presentations, etc., etc. Which, which we have that, really. We, yeah, they we have, have that. Yeah. We have that at the yeah. moment. I suppose right. the bigger picture. Of course, indeed. Uh, if that were spiced, perhaps just by occasional loans, possibly quite long-term loans of real objects, you know, you can never replace a real object. It really connects mm -hmm. you with the past. So, the sensitive mingling of the two approaches might might be might, yeah. might work quite well yeah i think colin is right you know it's probably more realistic frankly um but it would be a case of a loan anyway because all yes. the objects from the wrecks are yes. as state property they would only yes. be lent but I, I you know i'd actually remove the word only because there yes. are several museums that have long-term loans to the extent 
that you know they're unlikely to be taken back into into the National Museum in Dublin you know unless there's a, a change in the conditions yeah. like we do have loan conditions and um, that have to be fulfilled mm -hmm. but I agree with Colin that the picture I paint of the state of the art museum in, in in Grange I mean I really hope it happens someday but in the short term it's it's unlikely uh, but there is an awful lot you can do, like, for instance, with 3D modeling um, of Rex and some of the objects from Rex. Yes. You know, it's not just a case of, you know, posting a few photos on a wall. There's a lot that can be done. And the, the old courthouse in Grange goes some way in that direction. OK, well, that's a good note to finish on. Mm -hmm. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you both. Uh, Nessa O'Connor and Colin Martin for speaking with us here today about the 1985 dives at Strija. And just uh, to say, we'd like to also thank the Mayo Sligo Leitrim Education and Training Board for sponsoring today's discussion. And if you'd like to find out a little bit more about other webcasts we've been running on historical aspects of Strija and other matters, check out our website, SpanishArmadaIreland.com. Till next time, thank you for watching and bye bye.